I'm very excited to uh, introduce Priyanka Joshi. She's, um, amongst other things, my co-founder at NeuroAge. So extra excited to, to give this introduction. So Priyanka is a research fellow at University of California at Berkeley. Her research interests combine the biophysics of protein aggregation with metabolism and aging to identify the molecular underpinnings of healthy aging and age-related neurodegenerative diseases. Previously, she was the Everett Butterfield Research Fellow at Downing College, University of Cambridge, and an independent postdoctoral research fellow at the Center for Misfolding Diseases at the University of Cambridge with late Sir Professor uh, Christopher Dobson. At Cambridge, her work elaborated on the role of metabolites in the aggregation of Alzheimer's disease-associated amyloid beta and broadly unlinking metabolite homeostasis with protein homeostasis for a PhD work on designing a small molecule library um, to target intrinsically disordered proteins in neurodegenerative diseases. She was awarded the Sajay, did I say that right? Sajay? Medal for the best PhD in sciences in 2015 by Clara Hall, University of Cambridge, and was listed in Forbes 30 under 30, uh, science and healthcare. She's also the founding team member of NeuroAge Therapeutics, an aging clock-based pharma tech company that is targeting brain aging to reverse neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's. Outside of research, she actively mentors students and is involved in a range of outreach activities with school children and older adults in India, Africa, UK, and US. Um, thanks, Christine, for the very kind introduction the opportunity to talk about some of my previous work uh, about Alzheimer's disease and about the company. So first of all, before I begin, um, just to gauge the audience, how many of you do not believe or, be okay, how many of you believe in the amyloid hypothesis? Okay. You can raise your hands, nothing against anyone, and I'm not trying to convince anyone here as an academic, I would like to present to you some, present in front of you some of the research and to, because what I have encountered in many, many conversations is that we understand that amyloid does not do anything. Targeting amyloid is not a great strategy for drug discovery for Alzheimer's disease, but do we really understand the mechanistic effects? So as a biophysicist, um, I started off not knowing what aging is, like the biology of aging is, and from a very reductionist point of view, I looked at the proteins and how they aggregated in a test tube. And today I'd be talking to you what it happens, like that we need to go beyond amyloid, but there are things that are happening before amyloid, and we need to rethink amyloid in order to not target amyloid. Well, there was a tongue twister there, but yeah. So uh, Alzheimer's disease, as we know, um, as we understand or have observed, the main hallmarks are A-beta uh, plaques and tau inclusions in the brain. So 100 years ago, uh, Alois Alzheimer, he observed in his patient, Dieter, uh, that there were these plaques and he, and he uh, cate uh, characterized them. Now, there are commonalities among age-related neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's and ALS, and what is seen is that Aggregation begins from one part of the brain and then with time proceeds to other, other parts. Now, if there is selective neuronal vul vulnerability involved or not, or what really triggers aggregation is something we do not really understand. Now, for many, many years, many decades, just like the Greek philosopher, uh, the Greek astronomer Ptolemy and his um, Earth-centric theory, amyloid, a beta, has been sitting right in the middle and every other pathway has been revolving around it. And the main reason for this is the nature of research and things that have been focused on, mainly genetics. So about 5% of Alzheimer's is familial. And the occurrence of this pathology in individuals is mainly by, this, uh, by the autosomal dominant mutations in amyloid precursor protein, gamma secretase complex, PCN12, and, and also patients with Down syndrome, they show clinical ma manifestation much early on in life. And it's seen that they produce much larger amounts of this amyloid and, and hence it just aggregates. So what is the amyloid uh, cascade hypothesis? You have the uh, amyloid precursor uh, protein, which is cleaved by 
Beta and the gamma secretase complex. Now in the 70s and 80s, people designed molecules to stop this cleavage from happening, meaning that beta and gamma secretase complexes were inhibited from, interact, uh, from cleaving a, a, a amyloid precursor protein so that more of the amyloid is not formed, which is the A beta 40 and 40, 42 monomers. What is seen is that A beta amyloid precursor protein can be cleaved by these two complexes into isomers ranging from 39 to about 46 amino acids. And of those, A beta 40 and 42 are the ones that aggregate. 42 being the one that, is, that aggregates much, much faster. Now this monomer, under certain conditions, which we do not know, aggregates into two pathways. One is that it can form these oligomers, which go on further to form fibers and plaques. But A beta monomer can also aggregate uh, directly in, like, into these senile plaques. Now, the difference between the two pathways is that one is toxic and the other is non-toxic. And it has been shown in many studies that if it aggregates much faster and produces these fibrils, they might just accumulate and not cause any, uh, any damage but any toxicity, but oligomers, which, uh, could, which is a very heterogeneous species and its structure is something, it's still elusive, um, is they, they would cause uh, neurotoxicity, synaptic loss, and neuronal death by interacting with various cellular components. And then ApoE4 kind of predisposes, and, and now it's, there was a recent paper that came out that through the cholesterol pathway acts uh, to, uh, to, to, to fasten this process. Now this opposing evidence, uh, kind of, that there is opposing evidence that th there is aggregation that has been studied for many, many years, but the vast majority of cases of Alzheimer's are sporadic. And it's not so straightforward to conclude that familial and sporadic cases are similar, meaning that 5% uh, of people who had genetic predisposition, the way their proteins aggregate does not mean that the ones who have sporadic, meaning that they just develop Alzheimer's because of certain unknown, con certain other conditions, um, aging being one, if, if uh, their aggregates are pathogenic or not. And this, uh, the biggest uh, case here is that amyloid beta accumulation does not correlate with neuronal loss and, co loss and cognitive decline. Uh, and oligomeric species, they are endogenously produced, created, and the way they are studied, although they are cytotoxic, but we do not know the differences uh, uh, because of the differences in the way they are, in the analytical procedures. There's another protein called tau, which also aggregates and structurally forms similar uh, beta sheet rich structures. Um, it's said that A beta is the trigger and tau could be the bullet, meaning tau could, could be doing, but we, we don't know. And, um, uh, and, and transgenic mice, uh, they, they do carry mutations that are, a lot of studies have been done in transgenic mice, and mice do not get Alzheimer's, so it's more like an induced system. So again, we, we do not really know whether they are very representative or not. Now to understand proteins, uh, I would just take a step back and uh, show you that how proteins fold and misfold in a cell. So a protein, a pro, uh, once a protein is synthesized, it, it starts folding at the ribosome and then eventually folds and it could either fold into a nice native structure and perform its function. Now proteins are the workhorses of the cell, so they need to assume a, fun a, a structure, whether it's on their own or together with another interaction with some other protein, or they could uh, just misfold because of certain conditions and just stop performing their function. So in case of Alzheimer's, you have your A beta that is just misfolding, uh, misfolded, and it, it doesn't perform its function. Now, the fundamental nature of proteins could move from, uh, from its native state to an amyloid state, but there's another state called the droplet state, which is, uh, which is a liquid-like state, meaning that, and, and the proteins could go back, from, back and forth from this liquid-like state into the uh, solid state, dependent on uh, the conditions in the cell. And these these conditions uh, could be changes in physical uh, chemical conditions, um, and uh, because of post-translational modification, certain ligands that are intrinsically present inside the cell, uh, chaperones whose level changes due to aging, um, and, 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 and that could push these proteins to go uh, back and forth. Now the question is that at any given state, which is the dominant state? Or at any given time in the cell, which is the dominant state and whether that state is really causing uh, disease or not. Now life is on the edge. So 
we see these proteins, they fold and they perform their function, but in the cell, they're all soluble and they need to be soluble because if they aggregate, they, they just precipitate out. Now, the correlation between the expression levels of proteins that are in these protein misfolding diseases, it just sits at the edge of their aggregation rate, which means that they are metastable. That means any change in the environment could cause them to just flip over and aggregate. And at the microscopic level, this aggregation can start from a monomeric. Uh, so if you would uh, bring, bring it down to mathematical equations, uh, kinetics, which is the change of the ch rate of turnover of these uh, monomers to oligomers and fibrils, you could define them by uh, these constants where they represent primary nucleation, where you have monomers, they interact with oligomer, uh, they interact with each other forming oligomers and fibrils, uh, or the monomers could already interact with preformed fibrils, which, um, or, or, or the fibrils, they could just interact with more fibrils and uh, or monomers could interact with them and the, the thing could just elongate. So, so what we have shown um, uh, in my previous work and, uh, and some other groups as well is that these processes can be inhibited at different steps, either by small molecules or by antibodies, but also by endogenous metabolites that can change with, with different conditions over time. Now what this means is that a molecule, something that, uh, func that, that if someone already has, is in the late stage and already has a lot of aggregates, something that affects K, the, the rate constant Kn will not be able to stop the aggregation process. You would need some, a molecule, an antibody, or a metabolite that affects the K plus that constant. So, um, so it depends that which, which Microsco microscopic step is being targeted. Now in that context, uh, we've seen the failure of aducanumab, where it did not provide any cognitive benefits. And a way to understand is that not all anti-amyloid antibodies are equal, which means that these antibodies have different, they interact at, uh, with amyloid at different microscopic steps. So. Um, Aducanumab is uh, is acting towards a secondary nucleation where it just uh, where it doesn't let these uh, fibrils form form. So that would mean that ideally it would help patients in the late stage where already a lot of amyloid has been formed to stop further buildup of amyloid and reduce cognitive decline. But that has not been the case. We have not seen any uh, positive effects on uh, benefits on cognitive decline. And so has been the case for the other antibodies as well. Closely looking, aducanumab, which can we say that one antibody fits all? Well, no, because um, it, does not, uh, it does not affect primary nucleation. It only affects secondary nucleation. And, and, and also, it does, not, uh, it does not correlate with cognitive uh, uh, changes. So, so there are two questions that come here, which is that, A, are we, are we looking at the right species if we do believe in the amyloid hypothesis? Are we looking at the right species to target? Meaning that are we employing, are we segmenting the patients correctly? Are we employing the right patients for clinical data, uh, clinical trials? And those have been given the right drug which target the exact microscopic steps? Or the other is that the amyloid hypothesis is, just doesn't work, which we've which, which we've seen that uh, if you target these uh, fibrils, uh, there, there's no cognitive benefit. So with that, I would move to what made me th uh, think about aging. Like, uh, so as a like biophysicist, we just look at reductionist, like you know what what's really happening, and then but but I was interested that if I put this back into the context of aging, can I understand something? And uh, the reason is like protein misfolding diseases, they begin years before they present themselves in the clinic. And two, two things came up. So when I was uh, doing my PhD, I was designing small molecules to stop that aggregation from happening. But then from the library of molecules that I was creating, I found that many, many of them were metabolites, which essentially are endogenous metabolites. That means that our body intrinsically might have, over the course of evolution, have some molecules that just uh, maintain uh, homeostasis. And, uh, and the other thing was that uh, in, uh, uh, in my early 20s, uh, and I was doing my PhD, I was diagnosed with glaucoma. So two generations back, nobody in my family has gl uh, glaucoma, and my parents have confirmed that I am their biological child. So, uh, so, it's, uh, so it's not in my family, but I had early onset of it. And in conversations with my doctor, they were like, uh, you know, 
glaucoma is incurable. It also has links with Alzheimer's. And some of the aggregates start building up at the back of the eye, the op the, especially near the optic nerve that connects the eye to the brain. They were like, you're very lucky to be diagnosed so early because you only get diagnosed uh, when you start losing vision. And that's what happens with these protein misfolding diseases. Alzheimer's, when people start losing memory, where is the key, where is, you know, where is the car? So then, uh, and with age, you, you, you would go to the clinic and um, one, one would feel alert. But, but some of the diseases, uh, if they present much early on, you will never get to know unless uh, something drastic happens. So, and, uh, and age is the highest risk factor for all, most of these diseases. Now in this case, uh, sorry, some of the labels have moved. Yeah, I'll just focus on Alzheimer's. There is an exponential risk of developing Alzheimer's with age. Uh, and by the time you're 95, you could just have a 50-50%. And I'm, I'm sure like the lifestyle we all are leading, we're all gonna live many, many years, hopefully. So uh, we're all at risk of developing these diseases not to scare anyone. But uh, so some, in some of the uh, simple models, it has been seen that proteostasis collapse occurs when like C. elegans, uh, during its development, uh, uh, the proteostasis capacity decreases as, it's, as it ages. Some groups, uh, many groups have shown that, um, so for example, you see your, uh, th this is the total proteome, which is soluble at day two of adulthood, but becomes insoluble at day 10, which is, due to aging. And, uh, and this proteostasis collapse, uh, this, this aggregation, uh, again, as we see that it's a hallmark uh, of Alzheimer's. Uh, now what is, uh, so I was talking about metabolites, so I went back to, to the literature and databases and looked at uh, th the metabolites that are dysregulated in, a, uh, in Alzheimer's disease, and uh, a lot of them are correlated uh, or uh, associated with all the processes that are also dysfunctional during aging. So it could happen that these are the function, these are the, the, these are the processes that, that determine how we are aging well and whether we are predisposed to uh, getting these diseases uh, later on in life or not. Now, one thing that is uh, the specific aspects of cognition decline, they, they, uh, it's, uh, it's seen that the in the brain, the, the first thing that goes down uh, and is the working and the long-term memory and the processing speed. Even with, uh, uh, with, uh, with age, it's seen that the gray matter shrinks. Uh, there is loss of synapses, but not neurons uh, in the frontal lobe. And, um, and then in, in, in the neurons and in the glia, there are specific changes that happen in either directions, uh, which determine the cellular phenotypes, that is these expression changes with age. Um, uh, uh, for example, calcium dis uh, there's calcium dysregulation, there's mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, uh, and uh, th there are changes in the neurotransmitter um, uh, signaling. So uh, Christine, uh, in her 2019 paper, she had shown that these changes are associated with aging. So what are we doing now? So uh, she, um, in, her, uh, in Christine's paper, she saw that people whose biological, uh, by analyzing five, uh, from, uh, five patient cohorts and about 2,000 brains, she saw that people whose biological ages were younger uh, ended up getting, not, not getting Alzheimer's disease. So using that as the basis, uh, we, are, we have developed a neuroage proprietary um, uh, platform using deep learning, where we are taking data from transcriptome-based clocks, DNA methylation clocks, and also adding another component to it, which is proteomics, uh, in collaboration uh, with uh, an academic group at Pittsburgh, where, we are, where uh, this data is basically coming from DMT proteomics, but we are using highly quantitative unlabeled DIA proteomics to, to analyze this data and add this to our platform to identify those protein products that are, uh, that are specific to slow brain ages, and then go on to develop drugs to just target, uh, to target those, uh, those particular targets in order to slow down aging so that, the, so that people don't develop Alzheimer's disease. So how we see this is that the future is personal, meaning that right now we do not have uh, great diagnostics. We do not have uh, a compa companion diagnostics for patient sex segmentation, and we certainly don't have drugs. So at NeuroAge, we are looking, we're building a test based on this data uh, where we can 
find out what the biological age is, and then use that to segment, but then also use that data to find out novel drugs for, for Alzheimer's disease and in general other protein misfolding diseases. Um, with that, I a lot of work that I've not shown from my science, but a lot of people who've been behind uh, this work, both at uh, DTH, you know, Cambridge, and Berkeley. And uh, I was inspired by this book by George and Sumero, Biochemical Adaptation, where he looks at fishes, fishes that live and thrive in different geographical areas, and uh, just, and their ages differ, and the way, and, and they, they thrive differently at different, um, for example, uh, from uh, the seabed versus the sea uh, surface, and their, launch, uh, and their uh, lifespan depends on where they are, and they just do that by modulating small molecule metabolites uh, in them. And also thanks to Christine for, um, so, uh, for joining forces in this, uh, on this project. And thanks for your attention, and happy to take questions. Thank you.